Welcome to the Nehemiah Entrepreneurship Community Podcast. I'm your host, Patrice Sage, and I'm here today with my good friend, Al Caperna. We are continuing this dialogue on this book that, yeah. uh, that we're going to be putting together and uh, called The Spirit of Innovation. And today, we're going to talk about the launch of the Sanctuary Marketing Company, which is our original company that grew into what he called today's CMC Group. Al, welcome back to the podcast. Well, thank you, Patrice. It's an honor to be here again today. Well, I, in preparation for this, I was listening to our old podcast, and uh, I tell you, good stuff. I just appreciate the the solid insight and wisdom you're providing us, and it's gonna make it's gonna make a great book. And uh, but more important than that, I think we're gonna have uh, these podcast series as um, as part of posterity that others might be able to see and hear and and see it all happen. So, thank you for for allowing us to do this. My pleasure. Well, I'll, so let's talk. Last time you were here, we, we talked about how you settled <laughs> into uh, Bowling Green, and that became really the headquarters of, of, of uh, the company and, and where everything kind of grew from. Right. Today, I want to focus on uh, the launch of Century Marketing Company. So for, you told us before. So, um, so really, how you – tell us again – Again, how you initially got into business. So you are in Bowling Green. How does it? And you and you really, you're kind of doing ad jobs here and there. I mean, your, your wife is taking care of you. So how, how <laughs> did Al get into business? Uh, well, I'm going to go back just a little bit before a century. Uh, I actually had a job at a window factory. They interviewed me as a man to run a piece of equipment. During the interview, they needed someone to set up a preventive maintenance program. So I said, I could do it. <laughs> and they hired me to be the first person to set up the, the shop for preventive maintenance for this equipment, which I didn't know how to run. I knew nothing about. And uh, But I talked my way into the job, got it, and set the shop up and kept the factory running and learned a lot. From there, I got a job actually setting up a factory in Bowling Green called Cooper Tire and Rubber. Cooper Industrial Products, where we were doing extruded products. I got a job in helping set the plant up and help set maintenance up in that plant. Um, while I was working there, Patrice, the man that was running the dye shop had a had some health problems. They tapped me on the shoulder and said, can you make extrusion dyes? I said, yes. <laughs> Having not done it before. I was Having not done it before, yeah. So I became an extrusion dye maker without, a, without anybody to teach me. And ran that shop for a number of years. There I met a man <clears throat> that was working in this, the splice department. And he ended up taking a job selling labels in California. This was back in the, in the uh, late 70s. After he sold labels for about a year, he called me and said, Al, he said, the company I'm working with, they're just dishonest. I said, can you make labels? I said, yeah. <laughs> I can run a press. So my grandfather had actually left me some money about that time. I used that money, bought the first printing press. We started printing labels together. So uh, I went into manufacturing, making labels from a friend of mine who was running the splice department. And the thing I like to say, Patrice, is that God opens windows. Sometimes you just have to be willing to go through them. Wow. Let's talk about that. Because many entrepreneurs say yes to unknowns and that kind of so how do i know, how does one know whether it's courage is just risk or is just plain dishonest you know i mean how does one discern that you know um and talk to us a bit about that because many people watching and listening they can relate I, i've done it where you say yes i was yeah. I was doing a presentation last night with one of our, our, uh, the head of our technology department to a to a to somebody on the prospect, and and they were asking questions about some things that they wanted to see us do, and some things she felt was things that um, will 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 test her capacity, and right. as you say, you know, Patrice, um, the difference in you and I, you speak boldly about things you're not sure of. And I just can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Patrice, I think the difference is um, for me is 
you have opportunities and assignments. And that's something I learned years later. And also, I think that as you pray about things, sometimes God wants you to know what he's thinking. And sometimes God wants to know what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. So there is no formula. You can't always know. Ultimately, you're making a decision of faith. And uh, the, and then you just give yourself to it. So you pray about it. You seek counsel. I mean, some people say, Al, oh, what you just undertook is impossible. I go, yeah, but I believe I can do it. Mm. Now, the other thing that we learned, Patrice, is you, know, you got to have some margin in your life. Um, you got to have some ability to give. I learned years ago, I used to ask God, can I be a 110% person? And God said to me one time, well, that's just a lie. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, 100% is all you get. There is no such thing as 110%. You just get 100% is all you get. So if you don't have some margin in your life, you can't overcome huge obstacles. We have to give 80% of who you are to make it happen. Wow. I love it. So here's what I'm kind of getting to what you're saying, which is um, clarity of purpose. And it's kind of that discernment that, that sort of that whatever you're saying yes to, there's there's a level of confidence, not just based on you, but also based on and knowing what God can do through you. There's that kind of that sense. Right. But then what I'm also hearing is you have adequate margin that whatever the extra is required to make it happen, that you can give your full self to it. Right. Right. Now, I also know from so far your story, you have an amazing work ethics. Um, I know that based on hearing your story before, we're going to get into it today. Um, there have been times where you slept in your office just to try to get it done. How much of that matters? Because you're saying yes, but you're willing to do whatever it takes. There are many people who say yes, but not only do they don't have the margin, but also they don't have the work ethic. They're not willing to right. whatever it takes kind of attitude. Could you speak to that a little bit? Well, it's not just me either. I was married at the time. So when I say yes, we're saying yes. And I believe that God wants couples to say yes together. We are one in the spirit. God made us one. Um, when I said yes, my wife asked me, she goes, we had just had our first child. She was a couple months old. And she asked me, she said, honey, will we be able to afford this baby? And I said, well, based on my feelings, we'll either be able to afford 12 we won't be able to afford the one we have. <laughs> but she said yes with me, Patrice. So the first six months when I bought that printing press, I worked 20 hours a day, seven days a week. Wow. And what drove me was when I took the business over, when I became the manufacturing, um, we were months behind in our deliveries. And a lot of the people that were selling these labels were Christians, were brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I said, every day I'm late, I'm making one of those people a liar. And I will not go to sleep until I, until I defend their reputation and do what they promised to do. Wow. That's incredible. At this point, Al, you don't know it yet, but you're about, you're on the verge on the journey to becoming not only a multimillionaire, but also a player in the space of innovation. Are you aware of that at that time? Oh, no. I'm flat out just doing what's in front of me, Patrice. I mean, my wife, talk about me sleeping at work. My wife slept at work. We had a cot and a crib out there, and she would come out, clean up, feed dinner, and she'd go to bed, put my daughter to bed in a playpen. She'd go to bed on a cot. She'd get me up in the morning, bring me home, feed me breakfast, let me sleep for a couple hours, and send me back. And she did that with me for six months. Wow. That's, you know, that's, how that's a lot of loyalty, brother. That is incredible. You know, entrepreneurship is sexy and people look at people like yourself at the end of their careers. They see the focus on, you know, what they consider to be glamour, whatever it is. What's interesting about you is that there's not a lot of glamour around you um, because, you know, you're, you're a traditional Midwestern, you know. What if, yeah. if you, if you want to know Al, read the book, The Millionaire Next Door. That's Al Caperna, you know. the, <laughs> the, the And those of you who are from around the world, those are, the, the, the Midwest of America, the people that make our country run, they don't look like it, can tell when you look at them, but, but those are stable people. So, so many folks start business because they want to be successful. They want to make a lot of money, da, 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 so forth. 
And but yet, it's a lot of grit. So at this point, success is not what's motivating you. You just want to work, feed your family. You just you just you just responding to opportunity. Is that is that correct? You know, um, I, I don't know if you've taken strength finders, but my number one strength is responsibility. So if I commit to do something, I just got to do it. <laughs> you know, I mean that's just who. To God made me. I just feel responsible to do things right. When I see things, when I see make a commitment to something or see things that aren't right, I got to fix them. I got to work at it. So it wasn't so much my commitment or my desire to succeed. It was my desire to be faithful. I just want to be faithful in what I was given. I love it. So that gets you into business. Al, uh-huh. at which point did you did you realize that we're gonna make it, and what uh, what did that made you feel that way? Which time are you talking about that we almost failed that I thought we we're gonna make it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Patrice, um, back in 1983, 84, um, kid stickers uh, became popular in our country. Little little fuzzy stickers, all kinds of stickers became popular. Girls, young young girls started collecting them, and our company was ideal. So we started a division called Personal Expressions. We had this whole line of stickers, and it just took off. The neat thing is, our church was actually building a church building at the time. We decided everyone would go out and get a second job to raise money instead of us spending our own hours. We'd hire professionals to build the building right the first time. So I had 15 women from our church calling hallmarks in the country, selling stickers. And the thing just took off. The business grew so fast that we made the Inc. 500 list two years in a row. That's incredible. Making little fuzzy stickers. The the ironic part, Patrice, though, is the the month we finished paying for the building, and most of those ladies quit, the sticker market crashed. Wow. Crashed. So our business was growing. We projected to do $200,000 of sales and stickers in January of 1985. We did 20. Wow. <laughs> wow. Incredible. So it's it's really been like this. Oh. Yeah. And, but at a certain point, uh, you must have felt, you know, you have that we call in biblical entrepreneur discovery stage where you think about the idea and you have that startup stage and you kind of have that go go. At which point, even though you still have this, wasn't there a certain constant in you that kind of knew somehow it's going to work out based on just that it's been working out? And yeah, uh, you know, I'm going to go back and talk about one of our failures first. I know what you're trying to get to, but. So what happened when the market crashed, the company crashed. Mm. And um, our church at this time decided to start a church in Florida. So then a lot of the executives left to go plant that. So we lost a lot of our employees. And at the same time, we couldn't afford the people we had. So I bought out two of my partners and um, took over the company, probably the worst time possible. So. Um, I just felt like God would have me do it, and uh, I did it. So during a time when we had just made the Inc. 500 list two years in a row, we were celebrated for our growth. We crashed and almost burned, almost fell, and I had to go back and rebuild the company at that point. Wow. Wow. That is incredible. So our most we teach in biblical entrepreneurship this you know, mini MBA process, and I want to ask some questions about it because you probably didn't follow any of it. But I, but I, I want. <laughs> uh, so you know, we talk about you got to have a business plan, you got to have a financial forecast, all this, all this, all that. Right. How much of that did you have in the beginning? Nothing. <laughs> when I took the business over in 1985, um, I took two of my managers to Chicago for a week, and we took a, a, a the. Um, MBA or management weekend course on writing a strategic plan and putting a budget together. And my plan was to go to the course during the day and write the plan at night, <laughs> which was wow. too aggressive, which was way too aggressive. But what it did teach us is how to do it. 
So that's when we started. Five years in, we started with a business plan and budgets. Wow. So ha having had one five years later and didn't have one five years prior, um, so is, what is it that some people can do without it? Some people absolutely need it. What did you discover in terms of what's the difference here as our listeners are listening and watching and kind of figure out how important is it for them? I, I encourage everybody, Patrice, um, to have at least a one page business plan. And I, I tell people, if you can't write it in one page, don't do it in 30. Mm. If, if you can't explain it simply and uh, the way we describe it now is what does it take to play, win and own? And what is the size of your market? What is the size of the prize? So I want to know those four. I want to know the answers to those four questions. What does it take to play, win, and own, and what's the size of the prize? So I think it's critical that everybody has one, at least is at least even a one-page plan that describes that. And in that one-page plan, you got to have your strategic objectives. Now you can't plan for a market crashing like what happened to us. You know, the market crashed, and we didn't see it coming. It happened overnight, and we had to respond to that. But had we had a plan, we would have planned to have been. 20% bigger the next year, 30% bigger the next year, which now you have to, um, we have to do what I tell people, you know, when you plot a course to sail across the Atlantic from New York to London, you plot that course, but as soon as you untie your ropes, you got to sail. You got to work with the weather and the sea, whatever, whatever comes across your way. So business plans are critical, but managing is also critical. I love it. Let's actually talk about that. So, because Many entrepreneurs, as you know, this year, and you probably did the same face COVID-19, this pandemic, nobody saw right. it coming. So right. we can't plan for things like that. But what can we do, though, Al, um, to make sure that we as prepared as possible so that no matter what happens already, what are some things you've learned over the years? Because you've had a number of crashes over your lifetime. Well, I mean, let me go back to one of the things that happened. In one, in one season, we were growing quickly. And um, we felt like the Lord tell us to go the opposite direction of everybody else. So we stopped our growth, slowed our growth down, paid down debt. And we worked on our trained our employees. So we went the opposite direction of everybody else. And then the market crashed, Patrice. And we were sitting on cash. We weren't leveraged. The businesses that don't make it are the ones that have no reserve and are running right on the edge. So when something happens and you're running on the edge, you got no margin. You got... You, you know, they say when you're out of cash, they take you off the field. And God, fortunately, a couple of times for us has done that where he's we've we've got the signals from the Lord. We've slowed our growth down. We've slowed our expenses. We got ourselves into a stronger cash position so that we could weather storms. We did that two years ago. Two years ago, we restructured the company to get in a better cash position. So this year when COVID hit, we were strong. We didn't. We, we weren't in a weak place. We could weather the storm. Ooh, this is good stuff. So here's what I'm learning. Here's what I'm learning. So um, make every effort to have a strong reserve, strong balance sheet, not to be over leveraged, to have margins, essentially. Right. Because you don't know what could happen so that whatever happens, you're able to weather that storm. But, but. But but how how do I know as an entrepreneur? Let's say there's a, there's a one or more opportunities in front of me that requires me letting go cash, requires me borrowing. How do yeah. I know when to play it safe so that I may be prepared next twelve months, or when to be aggressive uh, so that in two years I'm in a better position? How do I do? How do I make that timing? Patrice, to me, that's always um, just hearing from the Lord. I mean, you can look at all the natural things. You got to do the natural things. You got to talk to your advisors, think about the market, think about the security, what things are happening, what the trends are. But it comes down to, I'll explain another deal to you. One time we were going to buy a company and everything was done. The bank had approved it. We were ready to make the deal. The next day I was supposed to go in and sign the papers. And I was praying that night and I felt like the Holy Spirit say, don't do it. And I didn't. And everybody was shocked. The lawyers were there. The bankers were there. I said, I'm not signing. They go, but it's done. It's all approved. They go, it's not approved. I haven't signed it. I felt like God say no. And 
like six months later, we had another market adjustment, which wow. if I'd have done that, I'd have stretched myself maybe outside of my margin. Now, there's times to stretch yourself. There's times where I have stretched myself extremely, extremely thin. Fortunately, there were no big market adjustments when I did that. So I think a big part, Patrice, is obviously doing all the practical stuff, but making those decisions in faith. God, I've done all the practical things. I believe I've heard your voice. I'm making this decision. Please be with me. I love it. I love it. So you can do all the natural things, but you have to be in the Lord. I think so. Be in tune with the Holy Spirit. And he will kind of prophetically speak to you as to what's happening so you might know. Now, so here's the thing. It takes courage to go against the natural when it doesn't make sense to the people around you, doesn't it? Right. Yeah, we've done that a couple of times, too. <laughs> we have something at work we call, you know, a lot of people are familiar with KPIs. You know what a KPI is, right? Key Performance yes. Indicator. Yes. Well, we, we renamed it, Patrice. In our business, KPIs are kingdom performance indicators. Mm. And kingdom performance indicators are things that God did for us. We, it's not something we did of our strength or our, our ability. It's something that God did. And I think every business person who is a follower of Christ should be able to list those things. They say, hey, yeah, this was just God's hand. He is the CEO. He does own this business. And he's taking care of it for me. And here's one of the things he did. Mm. I love it. I love it. Again, we're talking to Al Caperna, the chairman of the CMC uh, group, and um, and and we're talking about the spirit of innovation. And today, which is a a book that will be coming out uh, in in the future about his journey about building a an amazing uh, medium sized innovative company in the United States. And today, we're talking about launching uh, Century Marketing Company, which is his original company that he started. So, Al, so the, the way that you describe this evolution of the CMC, uh, the Century Marketing Group, it seemed as though you had partners with you at a certain point and you bought right. folks out. And so tell us a bit about that, the ownership of it. So, uh, you know, so tell us a bit about that journey and, and how you got to become chairman. Sure. Um, what happened was I had a friend who actually started a business selling labels as a distributor. Um, and it was doing pretty well. And then he said, out, we need to make them because I can't sell with integrity. So I bought, we started the company. I bought in as a full partner and um, started manufacturing. And the business prospered. We hired salesmen, mostly through churches. We would contact churches in cities and towns where we needed a salesperson, find faithful people that the church would recommend, hire them. We had probably 40 salesmen by 1985 selling across the country, up and down Main Street. I used to laugh, Patrice. I said, I got, I have two types of salespeople working for me. Those that used to be pastors and those that want to be pastors. <laughs> but one of my favorite ministries was working with these pastors that had been really damaged in the ministry and mm -hmm. helping restore them. And just has some phenomenal stories about restoration working with these men that had got into the ministry and, and just been worn out, beat up, abused, made mistakes. And God brought them to us to minister to. So that was probably one of my favorite parts of the business during that time. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, so you were really creating lots of jobs for, for pastors around the country and people in ministry around it. Yep. What was, yep. was that an intentional strategy or was it just something you bumped into, given that you were such so active in your local church? Well, the strategy was we, we when we do in hiring searches, we said, well, let's use the networks that we know. And we're looking for people of like values and ethics. Mm. So we decided we started networking through church networks and that worked well. And we just kept doing it. Wow. You just kept working. So, so, so you are at this point a, a partner with another friend of yours. So at which yeah. point does that? change where you have you either so owner or at least controlling um owner this is a tough story patrice but a good one so again in 1985 the market crashed and the business went into struggle um and you know there's a couple of things that happen tension always rises when problems arise right 
So the tension arose. We kept getting more and more, um, our relationship got more and more difficult to the point where uh, we had an advisor, a board of directors at the time, they got us together. And uh, I made an offer to buy my partner out. And the board of director who was working with us and our pastor actually, who was part of it, uh, advised my partner to take the deal. So I ended up buying the, buying the company um, from my partner at probably the worst time possible. Wow. It was going under. Wow. What, uh, I'm curious, first, what did your wife think about this bad business deal at the time? And second, what made you do it? Uh, my wife's just very supportive and she trusts me. She knew what we had done and she, she trusts what I, the decision I was making. What made me do it was the people, Patrice. Um, I had prayed years before that that God had given me a business that would help support his people. And I wanted to have a business that would, um, you know, be able to hire Christians and help them grow in their, in their marketplace calling. And I felt like this was my calling to do that. So that's what made me do it. Wow. So you, you, so you buy, now you're the fully controlling owner of a company that may right. not make it. All right. So, so what, how did it turn around? Well, um, again, God helped me. Our church decided to do a church plant and I lost a lot of employees, which I needed to do. I didn't have to let them go. And we hunkered down. You know, we cut expenses, we managed what we could, we looked for market opportunities, and we, you know, we rebuilt the business from, from where it was at. So we basically had to do another restart. And we've had to do that probably four times, four or five times where the market changed. And what you did yesterday doesn't apply to what you need to do tomorrow. It wow. just, the market changes. And a lot of people don't make it because they try to hold on to what market they had, not the way the market changed to, not to what the market changed to. Uh, was there a time in your journey where you felt tempted to give up the towel? I mean, was there a time you remember you said, you know what, this is where you kind of felt tempted to give up? Or did you always plot ahead and felt confident despite the ups and downs? Uh, there are some very difficult times. Um, had I actually considered giving up, I remember Patrice, one Saturday I drove to work, I was sitting in the parking lot. And I sat in my car and I was complaining to God about what was going on. And uh, I I remember stopping going, God, I bet people do this to you all the time. <laughs> and it was just a revelation to me that people complain. Um, I, I was just a guy that, you know, if, if I believe you're supposed to do it, you don't think about failing. You just think about how to succeed. Wow. Now, that doesn't that doesn't. You, you got to get to that. I, I have failed at things and, and you have to know when to give up. And we always say, if you're going to fail, fail fast. Don't fail with, slowly. Go ahead. With that, I talk about it because there's a power in, in failure. Um, as a matter of fact, I heard a story the other day that I really, that I thought was very interesting, uh, this book that I'm reading. Um, and the current Supreme, Supreme Court Justice, uh, John, um, the current Supreme Court Justice in the United States. Uh, so he has such a familiar name. It keeps his back and keeps running my head. But anyway, uh, his first name is John. But so he, uh, team looked for the current Supreme Court Chief Justice of the United States for me. So, so he was asked to give a commencement address for his ninth grade, uh, for his, for his, uh, uh, child's ninth grade, uh, graduation. Yeah. And it went viral. And, uh, one of the reasons why, because in the address, he said to that, I wish you failure. Wow. <laughs> He's out, and they asked him, you wish them failure. What was that all about? He said, because I've learned that the quicker you fail, and high school is the best time to fail, you learn. Yeah. Right. And, and, and over time, by the time uh, you grow, you know, John Roberts. And so let's right. talk about failure. So, 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 so somebody wished you failure. So talk a bit about the various failures you had along the way and kind of what you learned from them. And, and do you agree with John Roberts? So to finish that story about buying out my partner, um, I bought my partner out. I walked into my office about three weeks later. My CFO's there. 
and he's got his hands in his head like this. And I'm thinking, that's just not a good look. <laughs> <laughs> you think? <laughs> so I said, hey, what's up? He goes, you know, Al, he said, I've worked this everywhere I can. We're going to run out of cash. And uh, I was sitting on my chair and I slid off the chair onto my knees and then just face down on the floor and just started crying out to God. Um, he then did the same thing. And then someone else knocked on the door and they were in there. Before long, there's six of us laying on the floor in that office praying. That prayer meeting lasted six hours, Patrice. We were there for six hours. I kid people. I said, if the book of Acts hadn't been written, I could have put that in. So, but while I was praying, I felt like the Lord said to me, you're the man. And I said back to God, I said, well, I know the last guy you said that to, it didn't turn out so good for him. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of relationship God and I have. And I said, well, what is it? He goes, my desire was for you to have worked it out with your partners and you failed. Wow. And I went, I got nothing. <laughs> I mean, literally, I got nothing. I'm not defending myself. You're right. So after some time of repentance, I said, Lord, but for the good of your people, will you make another plan? Um, at that point, Patrice, our bad debt in the company was 7%. We felt like the Lord say to go and pray for our receivables and ask God, say, God, the worker is worthy of his wage. We did this work. Cause our customers to pay us. And bad day went from 7% to 1% and saved the company. Wow. You know. Um, that a neat story. <laughs> oh, my. That's incredible. I'm going to do a shameless plug here. Uh, friends, <laughs> many of you guys know this. My, my latest book is coming out, uh, Biblical Entrepreneur Essentials. In there, we feature a little story about Al Capernaum's business. Uh, you remember when I called you, I said, Al, I need a story. Yeah. And uh, Al allowed us to, this is a kingdom company. Uh, the, the kind of stuff. So with that, uh, let's talk about what's a kingdom company. Uh, okay. So so you just give an example of what kingdom companies do, right? In this stuff, when the math doesn't add up, right. when cash flow reality, we pray, we go before God. I mean, I, I think about the, the miracles of the Bible and, and this is one of them, I do agree with you. So, but you didn't kind of, when you first started, you just did what you, it's not like you kind of say, I'm going to build a kingdom company. That was just what right. you did. Am I right? right? You, just, you just build a company that reflected your values. You didn't go right. to a class like biblical entrepreneurship. So let's talk about that. So you start this company and. What would have been if I had that, Patrice? <laughs> <laughs> I know. So were you kind of like mad to just kind of think, oh, I'm just going to carry my faith into it. No, I mean, very few folks were doing it. Yeah, the, you know, there wasn't many people around back then to talk to you about it. Um, but there was, to me, uh, the way I would describe this is, the way I've learned to describe it, is I worked for years to come up with the definition of the purpose of business. And I, try, I had a lot of awkward statements, and I finally came down to one I like that I've stuck to. The purpose of business is to honor my father. Mm. So people ask me, what do you do to integrate your faith at work? And for years, I tried to answer that question. Then I realized it's the wrong question. What have you done to separate it? I, I can't separate that. This is who I am. I got to be honest. I got to work hard. I have to be responsible. That's just who I am. That's all I'm doing is being who God made me. Wow. But it sounds like and in that, out your carrying you're, you're, you're extending some of the virtues or some of the that you apply in your personal spiritual life such as pray about situations right. such as believe God for the miracle I mean in church we, we know about he can heal the sick and he can open blind eye and we know about all that right. but but when we come to business him re miraculously reducing your bad debt to one percent so you can care I mean we don't that's not something that's <laughs> logical. Well, I got a friend. I like the way he says it. 
because he, he wasn't really a businessman. He was a man that moved to another country to uh, serve and ended up in business. And he, he says, you know, God, your business has a problem. I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> I said, love it. I love your it. business has a problem, God. And I'd never said it that way, but I like it. And there's times I say that the guy now say, God, hey, your business has a problem. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> Knowing fully who the, the, you know, in biblical entrepreneurs, we talk about the fact that we use Joseph as an example of, of, of a true biblical entrepreneur because he owned nothing. It was all Pharaoh's business. Right. And I could just imagine something happened, Joseph going to first. So Pharaoh, we have an issue, boss. And that's essentially what you're saying here is that, hey, boss, we got an issue. How do we address it? And that, yeah. that, that's, a, that's a stress-free, that's a worry-free kind of CEO and yes. owner. Not my, not my business. I'm, I'm being faithful. I'm doing all I can. And I know I'm not good enough. I'm, I'm not smart enough. I'm not faithful enough. I'm not spiritual enough. So if God isn't my partner and taking care of me, picking up, picking up around me, I'm in trouble. Wow. So how we think about those early days and what it is that made a uh, century marketing company into a kingdom company. Obviously, we heard the, the virtual prayer. You, you, when you yeah. felt blocked, you, you immediately went to your knees. And you, it seemed like your team just followed you. And it's not like you had employees who were also people of faith, so that was not as difficult. What are some right. other things that you felt that was done intentionally or unintentionally that really made this the mark of a kingdom company? What are some things you can... Uh, we wanted to be excellent. So early on, and we didn't talk about this, but I did have a... Uh, um, I hired a board of advisors right off the front, right out of the bat. So I got people around me that were smarter than me and they had a critical role in a lot of our decisions because of their experience. So I surrounded myself with wise counsel. Mm. Um, and the Bible says in the multi counselor, there's safety. Right. So I never really just trusted my own opinion and my own ability. I always, at least I'm going to go somewhere. I was going to have to disagree with someone if I didn't think it was right. So I had to consider what they were saying, right? I, I lo- could you say that again? That's because you're a pretty strong-willed guy. And uh, say that again, because I think sometimes people assume that just because I have counsel, having counsel, I mean, I'm, I'm going to always agree with them. It's either one or the other. I, right. I either agree with them, or I don't have them. But, but you are taking an approach that suggests that friction is good. Tell us a bit right. about that. Say it again, please. Well, Patrice, I know what I'm thinking. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I don't know what you're thinking. So unless I hear your opinion, I can't consider it as an option. So when I have a counselor that would give me an opinion and I'd go, okay, I'm, I've listened to what you have to say. I've considered it. I disagree. Um, this is actually my business. I'm going to go this direction because I'm the one at risk. And I think this is the path I've chosen. So I, I don't always take my counselor's advice. It takes lots of courage to do that because most Christians are passive aggressive. They don't want confrontation. And so what you just described there is not fun for most believers, Al. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the issue, isn't it? We have to be willing to confront. Right. You have to. There's a, another one of the funny, funny stories. When I bought my partners out in 1985, I've been working crazy hours again. It was like 11 o'clock at night. I got home and I'm looking through my mail and I got a court summons to go to be on jury the next day. I call my attorney up, get him out of bed. He goes, Al, you got to go. I mean, you did call me earlier. I probably could have get out. You got to go. Well, I got my first board meeting tomorrow. I'm going to miss it. So they decided to have the board meeting. I'm at this court case, the longest single court case in Bowling Green history at the time. Went to 11 o'clock that night. Wow. It wouldn't, it just wouldn't get over. And I'm talking, calling my CFO up, and he goes, God, Al, these board members are ripping me apart. They're just, they're brutal. So I fired the whole board. (laughs) I just took the company over. I missed the first board meeting. They're mistreating my CFO, and I fired him. (laughs) Started over. Wow, that's bold. That is bold. I love it. So again, we talked to Al Caperna about him launching Century Marketing Company. So Al, at which point does Century Marketing Company become the CMC group? 
1990, we had a competitor that was a little bit bigger than us in the market, very well known. We were the two leaders in our market, actually, in the country. And uh, here's another crazy story. So at one of our business retreats, we went up and we got a retreat center close to their office. And we drove by a couple of times and we asked, we just asked God, said, God, give us this business. We just went and asked God to give us that business. And a couple of years later, I met the man at an event. And um, I asked him if his business was for sale. And he said, no, it's yours. And we, started, <laughs> we, we started the bicker. And about a month later, we met at a hotel and discussed it. And we made a deal. and I bought the company. Wow. And, and this made you the biggest player now. In our market, yeah. yeah. Wow. And so the name, CMC versus uh century marketing company yeah the uh that company was called continental marketing and ours was called century marketing so we created a logo cmc continental marketing century or century marketing continental kind of tried to get the market to accept us as one tried to make the transition smooth so we kind of put the two names together and that's kind of what uh brought about the cmc group right. wow I, I I love it. This is, I mean, just great, great, great insight here. Um, Al, we, we're going to wrap up now. But we're going to have you come back, and, and I want to deal with building the family. So in the midst of all of this, Al built the family for sure. We're going to talk about that. And I'm going to come back to business. I want to deal later on to build a family. I want to take each aspect of business discipline and, and talk about how you dealt with it in terms of innovation. Uh, first of all, you experienced a lot of growth through innovation. We'll talk about first growing through innovation. We're going to deal with the various innovations you kind of came up with. Right. But then we're going to look at how do you market an innovative company? You know, how do you manage innovative company? You know, how do you operate? How do you finance innovation? So we're going to deal with that. So again, guys, right. continue to be on the lookout here as we take each piece of Al's life and Al's business journey. And of course, we're going to later on get into his ministry involvement, his philanthropy, and just how he's been able to, through all of this, impact Bowling Green, the kingdom, and of course, uh, America. Well, Al, there are many people watching and listening from around the world. And obviously, let's first speak to the United States of America. You know, uh, our elections occur, there's a dispute. Uh, it seems like at the end of the day, Biden may become our next president. Um, could you encourage, I know that there's 50% 50, 50 of the people who are not very happy today. What can you say first to encourage um, our people in the midst of the election, how it ends up? Um, can you encourage our people first today in terms of what happened recently? Yeah, sure. There's a, there's a couple of things. Um, you know, in the Psalms, it says, this is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And that's not a request. It's a command. <laughs> I love it. So, you know, we got to get back to the point and say, God, thank you for today. Mm. You're on the throne. Thank you for today. And, and, and uh, I serve a king. I serve a king and a Lord. Um, the other thing is that I had a friend share with me the other day something Winston Churchill said, used to say a lot. And it's for some crazy reasons, it's encouraged me a lot. And it was KBO. Keep boogering on. <laughs> <laughs> And he used, to, he used to say that. And for some reason, Patrice, that's just lifted my spirit. You know something? I'm not going to quit what I, who I am. We talked about the perseverance and building the business and just that we were going to be who we say we are. If we're who we say we are, then we're just going to keep going on. We're not going to give up. We're not going to get disappointed. We're just going to put our shoulder back down and say, look, God called me to build the kingdom and I'm going to do it. So I'm not giving up because somebody disagrees with me. Wow. What good advice. Let's speak to the, to the world. Al. So we just told us how you launched this company and it was gutsy. I mean, you persevered. Uh, you took some bold moves. You had to repent. Uh, you had to pray. Uh, you took risk um, right. and it panned out for you. So there's an entrepreneur watching and listening and, and, and they want to be encouraged. What's, what's, what would you advise them? What's the key thing you did that they had to keep in mind as they navigate their own journey? What advice would you give them? 
I think the key thing, Patrice, is when a window of an opportunity opened up, I went in, I went all in. Um, I just didn't, I didn't take, I didn't worry about say, well, what if I fail? I didn't go to bat trying not to miss. I went to the plate convinced I was going to hit it. And if I didn't, if I struck out, I found out a way to get back at bat. So I think the commitment is if the window of opportunity comes up and you decide to take it, go all in. I love it. The Bible says that the just shall live by faith. It's a conviction right. and a belief that all will work out. Al, as always, thank you so much, my friend. We look forward to having you back. Yeah, wow. My pleasure. I enjoy these times. You you make me pull back some old memories, Patrice. <laughs> oh, good memories indeed, man. Thank you again for joining with us. It's awesome. Listen, uh, guys, before you leave, I want to pray for you. Um, I, I, as a matter of fact, I, I'm going to ask you to pray today. I'm going to ask Al to pray for you. Before he does, though, let me uh, do a little commercial. Hey, my book is out, um, Biblical Entrepreneur Essential. So if you want to even get your copy yet, you want to do that. Uh, actually, it's, it's at the printer. It should be out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, just go in and uh, order your copy today. You get a pre, uh, pre-release pre special. Uh, just go to our website, you can get a copy. Also, if you want to know more about Nehemiah Project, go to nehemiahecommunity.com, nehemiahecommunity.com. There you can learn about a training program, Biblical Entrepreneurship, about Inner Destiny, another training program that we have to help you grow your business or launch one. Uh, you can learn about our coaching program where we have our group coaching and your coaching to come alongside you with your business. Or oh, learn about our Act of the Capital we can learn about uh, how we can uh, finance your business uh, or help you connect to financing and growing your company or how to become a member of our community. We're building one of the fastest growing Christian business communities in the world uh, with entrepreneurs, members from all over the world. And you can be a part of that, learn about how to become a member. So that together we can transform the world. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please share it. You may know entrepreneurs or individuals who want to be encouraged about launching their own business around innovation or any industry, the things that I'll share today is helpful for any of us, no matter what kind of business that you're a part of. So share it on your social media platform, share with your friends and family. You know, if, you, if you're a good person, you share what helps you. So share with others, don't keep it to yourself. With that said, Al, could you please pray for our people today? First, I'd like to just recommend what Patrice said and, and compliment it. I think Patrice is 100% right. I know a lot of organizations and Nehemiah Ministries is one of the best. So Nehemiah Project is one of the best. So I encourage you to follow Patrice's advice there. And Father, we do thank you that um, you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We thank you, God, that you're firmly established on your throne, that your authority cannot be challenged. We thank you, God, that uh, you call us your, your servants. And Lord, we cast off frustration, fear, anxiety today, and we we put our confidence in you, Lord, and the fact that you are a loving father and that you care for us and love us. Lord, I believe the answers for this earth are in your people. I pray today, God, that you'd raise up your people, God, to bring forth the answers for the earth. Did you cause the men and women, God, that are serving you, did you, your favor be upon them, God, that your favor would bless them and strengthen them. I pray, God, they would find men's favor, too, that, that the favor of man would come upon them also, God. And that they would walk in just this dual favor that would cause them to advance, God, and lift up the name of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I pray that anybody has heard this podcast or has talked to Patrice or Nehemiah Ministries, God, that you would be with them, God. That you would increase them and increase their, their authority and their presence on the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I receive it. Al, thank you. Thank you for the commendation. God bless you all. Have a great week. God bless you.